All right, we're just waiting for Emily to be able to uh, get this up on the live stream. Sarah Fox, are you here with us? Just waiting for one more committee member. Sarah Fox, are you here yet? I think so. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, someone's computer is unmuted in here. Um, I will call the meeting to order at 7.03. Um, the members present are Sarah Gold, Megan Taylor, Emily Barron, and David Harris. Sarah Fox, are you here with us yet? Okay, so Sarah is not, so hopefully she'll be able to join us soon. Um, this meeting is being recorded by MHTV and it is being live streamed to YouTube. Um, just as a little kind of preface to this evening, um, we just wanted to alert everyone to the fact that earlier today, the Board of the Department of, Edu of Elementary and Secondary Education granted the Education Commissioner the authority to mandate masks to all K-12 school buildings throughout the state. As it is currently proposed, this mandate will remain in place until October 1st. This is a mandate and it must be followed in our district buildings. While we are sure this is a relief for some on this call, it is probably upsetting for others. Dr. Bucky will be talking more about this in his presentation this evening. We have a packed agenda for both tonight as well as Thursday. So we have a few requests for the public joining us this evening. In case everyone isn't aware, we amended our agenda for Thursday and added the K to three third grade schedule. Tonight, our agenda is focused on Dr. Bucky's update for back to school. These are both incredibly important topics and hearing from people is important as well. For this reason, we are going to ask that people keep their public comment to topics that are on the agenda each night. We also will ask that people keep their public comment to three minutes or less in length as stipulated by our public comment policy. This will allow us to hear from everyone who wants to comment, but will also keep our meeting on schedule as we work to understand everything going on in our district. Emily will be helping keep track of the time for each of the public comments. In order to be courteous to the professionals we have joining us with, within their hiring process, if there's still a long list of people in public comment around eight o'clock, I will ask that we pause and improve the hiring of these two professionals. If needed, we can then resume the public comment. 
Finally, in the true spirit of Gary Spies, we will ask that if someone has already made the point that you want to make, know that you can simply take your hand down or state that you agree with the points made by so-and-so without having to make them again. With that, I will ask anyone who wants to participate in public comment to use the raise hand function and uh, we will call on you. Um, please remember to state your full name and address for our record. Sarah, glad to see you. Sarah Fox has joined our meeting. All right, uh, Jessica Schott, go ahead. Hi, Jessica Schott, Three Oak Circle. Um, so I'm speaking tonight because last week I emailed the school committee and the administration in regards to the proposed schedule for the school year. Um, the morning recess had been done away with. And while I completely understand the core curriculum requirements of five hours a day, I'm really still concerned that more that morning recess has only been promised through the first trimester. The perspective of which I am about to explain comes from a dual certification in elementary and special education. And at one point in my career, I held licensure in 42 states. Morning recess needs to stay intact for the entire school year for these three reasons. Research, and there's a lot of it, shows that kids in grades K through three benefit from two recesses a day. It increases on-task behavior, improves memory and attention, and increases cognitive performance abilities. Secondly, our special education children, those with ADD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, executive functioning, behavioral impairment, sensory issues, and children with many more disabilities will be significantly impacted by the schedule change. These children need frequent sensory and motor breaks in order to thrive in the classroom. Lack of daily morning recess for the entire year would harm our most vulnerable population. Third, mental health in this country has deteriorated in the past 18 months. Recess is the time when kids socialize. This is when kids run and play, engage in sports and games, and see their classmates laugh and smile. Recess is where children play. We have a mental health crisis in this country and we must ensure a twice daily social opportunity. In regards to the proposed schedule, a remaining concern that I have is the shortening of the school day by 15 minutes. If you multiply that by 180 days in a year, that equals 45 hours of missed social and academic time. That's nearly a week and a half less of school. From what I understand, lack of monitors due to budget issues and teachers contractual time is an impediment of this 15 minutes. I would like to suggest a rotating coverage schedule utilizing specials teachers to increase our school day back to what it was and what it should be. We must be flexible in our thinking to avoid this deficit of 45 hours. That is a lot of time to miss out on of interacting with friends and classmates. Lastly, school committee, this is a message to you of how much of this proposed schedule were you aware? You often speak about your concern for the emotional toll that COVID has taken on our children. And yet you initially chose to approve a schedule. Second warning. Okay, of less socialization. We cannot defer this decision. Our kids need to play together twice a day, every single day for the whole year. I want this schedule to be solidified and I want our children to have two daily recesses and an increased 15 minutes every day. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jess. Um, I will ask just once again, um, just so that we can keep everything um, and be addressing what's coming up on our agenda, um, that we are talking about the things that are on the agenda this evening and then on Thursday when the K-3 to schedule does come up on our agenda so that we can address a lot of the concerns that are out there. All right, um, I don't have anybody else's hand up, so I will move us along uh, to our veteran school nurse approval. John, sorry. Can you hear me with a thumbs up because we were having some technical difficulties that began. Sarah Fox, can you hear me? You're I a little, that, uh, Mr. I call it pixelated, but that's not the right word. Do you say the picture is pixelated, sir? No, I said your voice sounded pixelated, but that that wasn't the right word. <laughs> is it coming through clearer now? 
it's still really choppy, unfortunately. You may want to yeah. unplug, unplug your headphone and plug it back in again and see if that might do something, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt. If I just use the computer instead of the headphone? It's still bad. I think you have a choppy internet connection, unfortunately. Do you want me to just jump in, John? Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm pleased to bring to you uh, outstanding finalist for our nurse position, Amanda Mavro. She's right here. Uh, Amanda comes to us with two bachelor's degrees, the first from the Mass College of Pharmacy in both health science and nutrition, uh, the second from the MGH Institute, Institute in Nursing. She currently works the Brig Brigham and Women's uh, in the Pediatric and Adult Radiation Oncology Unit. Uh, she's also worked in the Hematology and Oncology Unit there too. She has also worked with the Spalding Rehab in both their adult and pediatric units, and she's been an on-call substitute for both Marblehead and Swampscott for this past year. Um, past folks that have worked with her and uh, past supervisors described her as organized, energetic, professional, caring, and compassionate, and we really like those last two. So I present to you uh, Amanda. Thank you. Welcome, Amanda. Hi. Hi everyone. My name is Amanda. Um, like Matt said, I, you know, my history for uh, nursing experience. Um, I've been in the Marblehead community for um, about 10 years now, um, babysitting um, and just getting to know different families. Um, so I, when I saw this opportunity as a per diem um, nurse, I definitely was really interested in it. Um, and I immediately messaged Deanna um, for this opportunity. So thank you for having me onto this com school committee. And I look forward to working with all of you. We're pleased to have you here this evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, I will ask if any of, the, any of the committee members have any questions for Amanda. I think your resume speaks for itself. The institutions that you worked at are, are definitely top notch and we're happy to have you. Thank you. Couldn't agree more. All right, well, if there's no other questions, then I will ask for a motion to approve Amanda Mavros as the nurse for the veteran school position. So moved. Megan moved. Second. Emily second. All right, I will roll call. Sarah Gold, yes. Megan Taylor. Yes. David Harris. Yes. Emily Barron. Yes. And Sarah Fox. Yes. All right, that is approved five to zero. Welcome aboard, Amanda. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me let Dr. Bucky in from the waiting room. We'll see if this works better. Can anyone hear Dr. Bucky? Not a word. No. All right, he's going to trade seats with Megan, I think. You go over to his seat. Uh, unmute yourself. You're still muted, sir. No, no. I Third was time's a charm. <laughs> Here we are. So we have recommended a long-term sub nurse with um, Eveleth opening this fall. Uh, we needed to have coverage for a nurse position there. Um, the state has really expanded their COVID testing program, which we will hear more about later. Um, and so we are recommending uh, uh, Joseph uh, Griffin for your consideration as the long-term sub and the COVID testing coordinator. So Joseph is here with us this evening. Um, if he would like to say a few words uh, before the committee has any questions for him. Joseph, welcome. Are you here with us? Hold on. 
All right, I actually don't see him right now. Let me. I don't think he's with us at the moment. Okay. Um, how would the committee like to proceed on this? Are you okay to vote or do you want to wait to see if Mr. Griffin is, uh, maybe he's- I think it's a problem. I, I'm assuming it's a technical problem, but I think it's yeah. probably best to um, wait till he's here. Which apparently they've cut the school day all right. Um, so that, yeah, I would, I would agree with that, Sarah. Um, so we will just wait and move it to the Thursday agenda. Yeah. Yep. Or if Mr. Griffin is able to come back on, we can absolutely swing back to him on this agenda as well. Okay. All right. Let me find my agenda. Can I have my notebook? Can I have my, my stuff? Right. Dr. Bucky, that brings us Back to you for the event that I'm sure everyone is waiting for this evening, the back to school COVID preparedness plan. Take it away. Ah, so I'm going to have to go old school because my computer. Okay. Be able to share my screen. All right. What a difference a day makes. Great, thank you. So that computer is totally out of service. So I think that people have uh, access to the materials in the materials packet um, online. Yeah, that would be great. If you could share your screen. So planning for uh, returning in September has been ongoing all summer. And although we didn't have um, a 57 page document, uh, which I'm sure Megan is very thankful about, um, there is a 12 page document that outlines um, our return to schools this fall, some of our priorities, um, information. Uh, much of it remains the same because we so successfully uh, concluded the year with full in-person instruction. So the guiding principles that we had last uh, fall when we reopened, and then this, uh, this fall, we will reopen with similar uh, priorities. The next slide is kind of the guidance that DESI has provided over the summer. And in May, they said that schools would be required to be in person full time five days a week. And as I said, we successfully were able to do that to end the year. Then DESE and the Department of Public Health put out some guidance for districts that was released on July 30th. The superintendents, the North Shore superintendents started meeting weekly in August to review the guidance and to make decisions pr primarily around masking but other return to school policies. Um, on August 11th, they hosted a COVID-19 testing program webinar where they rolled out this really comprehensive uh, program that will include three different components, have a significant uh, support system um, from CIC Health and provide uh, district, districts with resources. I asked Andrew Petty and Deanna McMahon to attend that with me. All three of us were very impressed, but realized the expanded program um, last spring, the pooled testing program in the state 
because it was generally unsuccessful and people didn't participate in the numbers that they wanted to are consciously trying not to call it pooled testing. And so um, we realized with the expanded format that putting that work on our existing nurse staff uh, would not be doable, manageable. So that was the uh, decision to advertise this as a one year grant funded position as a uh, COVID testing coordinator. They then sponsored another webinar two days later, Deanna and I attended that. We applied that day. Uh, we have already been accepted uh, into the program. And a lot of people have been asking, um, you know, why haven't we announced? Other districts have announced and uh, many districts were voting this week and waiting to see if the commissioner or the governor would weigh in in some way. And I think everyone is aware that on Friday, the commissioner called an emergency meeting and then today asked the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to mandate masks until October 1st. And so that's the position we find ourselves in this evening. Um, the Marblehead vaccination rate for our students and the community is very, very high. The incidence of COVID in our community is relatively low. And so I can't predict what will happen on October 1st, but if the conditions are similar here and there isn't something that has changed in the public health uh, domain, I think we come back to this conversation on vaccinated, unvaccinated staff, mask, or staff and students, mask or unmask. Um, but for this evening, that is not a choice for us. Um, if you go to the next slide. This is the information uh, that we posted that prior to today, uh, Desi was strongly recommending that students K to six wear a mask when indoors except for medical exemptions and behavioral needs. Um, masks are not needed outdoors and may be removed while eating. Similar, strongly recommend for unvaccinated staff uh, and students in grades seven to 12. Um, when I put this information together, we were waiting to see what the board would do. And as I think I've said now three times, the board voted today and it really is out of our hands. Next slide, please. So some of the safety considerations and mitigation strategies remain the same as they did last spring. Um, we will have masking in the schools. We have an expanded uh, diagnos diagnostic testing program, which Deanna McMahon is gonna kind of outline for you. Um, there isn't a distancing requirement in the DESE recommendations now, but as we said last fall, we are able in most instances in Marblehead to maintain three foot distancing if not more in most of our classrooms. And we will try to do that whenever possible. Um, ventilation, we continue to use the MERV 13 filters. We have air purifiers in every classroom. Any staff member who requests one gets it. If there are larger spaces, there are multiple air purifiers. We have once again, significantly invested in tents to encourage alternative spaces for eating, for uh, classwork, uh, we, make, we encourage teachers to take their uh, classes outside and utilize fresh air as a significant mitigation uh, strategy. We continue with hand sanitizers and uh, maintain seating charts so that uh, as we need to do, and hopefully we don't need to do, uh, close contacts, uh, we have that information readily available. Masks are still required on school buses. Um, and so children riding uh, the bus, but they have adjusted the language around close contacts on school buses, if mask and the windows are open. And that is really how detailed information has gotten. So I will turn it over to Deanna McMahon right now to walk us through uh, what she has uh, shared with the superintendent's advisory and leadership team uh, the last two weeks in reviewing uh, the expanded state testing program issues around close contacts and need for quarantine. So Deanna. Next slide. Welcome Deanna. Hey, how are you? Good evening. Um, so the testing services are going to be included for COVID-19 testing. It's a three tier program. And in Marblehead, we've decided that we're gonna take advantage of all tiers. We would rather have everything available to us and dial back if we need to. 
uh, we think that that's the best direction to go in. So in these three tiers, symptomatic testing is clearly stated there. The first block, it's orange. For when individuals present symptoms while at school, individuals should not go to school if experiencing symptoms while at home. So that being said, we're still gonna have a daily health attestation. It's been updated and um, changed for the guidance that's happening now. I, I will discuss that in a little bit and that will be a student and staff uh, daily attestation. That first brief paragraph there means if you don't feel well and you're not, you're feeling ill, you shouldn't be coming to school. Um, samples are collected at school using the Bionex Now rapid antigen test. And those tests, those that test negative will be able to, that, hey, wait a minute, those testing negative will isolate with iso, isolated symptoms can stay in school. I, I have to go over that again, I'm sorry. So if you come to school and you're fine in the morning, which happens, we all know this happens, and a child were to feel sick during the time in school, the nurses are going to have a Bionex Now rapid antigen test in their office, and they're going to be able to test that student should they have symptoms that are similar to COVID. You should not come to school if you are feeling sick and do not pass the daily attestation. That's how I would like to, to frame that. The next category tier is called test and stay. And for test and stay, it's for close contact testing. When an indi when an indi for individuals who are close contact with COVID-19 positive individuals while at school, samples will be collected using the Bionex Now rapid antigen tests and tests are administered daily for at least five days from the date of exposure. So what this means is if you're in school and you're closer than three feet, because we're all going to be masked at least until October 1st, due to um, Commissioner Riley. So if you are closer than three feet, which will occur in certain cases, especially in the elementary schools, you will be considered a close contact, even if you have a mask on. And in that situation, we will have seating charts in the classrooms and the nurse's office and administrators will be aware of who is going to be identified as close contacts. Those families will be notified that their child is a close contact. And at that time, if they have um, consented to test and stay, which we're hoping most people will do, uh, they can come into school and for five consecutive days, they will be tested with a Bionex Now test by the school nurse in order for us to assess their COVID status in five consecutive days after the last time they were exposed. Ideally, they want this to be for seven consecutive days, but weekends are gonna fall in and we only go to school five days a week. So it all is gonna depend on the date of last exposure. Um, I have a, a more detailed bit of information to give you after we pass through this slide. Um, tests will be administered daily for at least five days from the date of exposure. The last category is routine COVID pool testing. Routine pool testing, it's going to now be called COVID safety checks. Uh, uh, routine pool testing and school-based follow-up testing samples are collected at school if a pool is positive, a following up testing at school with either Bionex Now or individual PCR testing as necessary. Routine pool testing and lab-based follow-up testing. This is the one that I'd like to have us do here at Marblehead Public Schools. Samples will be collected in a pool and if a pool is positive, the individual follow-up testing will occur through lab without a second sample collection. What that means is, we will have COVID safety checks pooled testing once a week at each building. Ideally, after October 13th, we will have five schools. So we will have five days of the week. Each school will have the same day of the week that they will have pool testing. We're going to buy for using the uh, nasal swab and we're going to have each student nasal swab, two swabs at the same time. One swab will go into the pool and be sent off to the lab. The other swab will be saved with their identification number on it. And so if a pool test were to come back positive, we'd be able to know which pool came positive, take all the second, the second swabs from those kids or staff and retest them individually without having to ask families to bring their kids back, which I really like. I think that this is a great change for our uh, COVID safety checks pooled testing. Yeah, if I could just jump in there for a second, yes. because Go we ahead. got a priority status in the application, that is the program that we are approved for. So we will be doing the lab-based testing, and they'll be able to identify if there's a positive, who the positive is via the lab. Great. So that's basically the testing program. I don't know if you want me to take questions all at the end, Sarah Gold, or if you want me to take questions on this now, because I just discussed it. 
John, do you have a preference? The close contact and contact tracing and quarantine is pretty complicated. So if people have questions around the new testing program, it might be good to ask them now. Great, that sounds good to me. Sarah? Um, so I have a couple for John from before, but I can hold those to the end. And then as far as Deanna's questions go, first test and stay, that will be like right when the children come to school, they'll immediately get tested. They're like not going to go to their classroom first and then come to you to get tested, right? We're going to isolate them and do that test to stay that day prior to them entering uh, uh, any type of group setting that would then push us to have to, you know, possibly test or quarantine more kids. Correct. Best practice is that those children that are identified and have consented for test and stay come to the nurse's office first, and they will not be out into the building until we know that their, their Bionex now test is negative. Should their test, test come back positive in the 15 minutes, they'll have your, their parents will just be called and they'll be sent home. This is going to happen during school hours, not prior to school hours. Okay, perfect. And then the symptomatic testing, that's also for, available for teachers and staff as well, right? It is, but it's, I don't want people to be confused. This is not symptomatic testing, like you're symptomatic at home and you come in to get tested because we're not going to be a testing site. This is symptomatic yeah. testing if you become ill during the school day, which we know no, that makes sense. Okay. I just don't want families to get confused. We can't do that kind of volume. Yeah, but like if a teacher, you know, say mid morning starts to feel a little off they they don't have to make it through the day and then go test at a site they could also pop down to the office and get tested correct during work hours of course yes okay perfect thank you okay megan has a question i think you need to put the headphones on Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Thanks, Deanna, for this. I appreciate it. Um, so just two quick questions. One is the consent process for the in-school testing, especially that's, you know, the symptomatic testing that you mentioned. What's the process for that? So the CIC is, is um, providing us with a link that's going to go out to everyone. That link also comes in several different languages. So when people, when people sign up for consent on the link that's gonna be sent out, they'll sign up for consent. And my understanding is they'll be able to choose the language that they need the consent in. And then at that time, that's how they're consenting. And I believe when they're consenting, they're consenting to each of these levels because we are, um, we are qualified for all three levels, but I may not be correct on that. But I do think consent is, we're trying to make it very simple and very, you know, less complicated. So will that come out in like an email from the principal? So it's very, very easy for prior to school to... start. Yes. Okay. Okay. And if then I'm wrong, John can just add whatever he needs to add. Okay. And then um, with the COVID safety testing, or I'm not sure if I'm calling it the right thing, the previous test school test. test. Yeah. The, what was oh, pool pool, the COVID before. safety check? Pool, yeah. Pool the safety. Tested. Yes. Yes. Um, what, what are some ideas to increase the participation in that, especially for you know the younger years where their vaccination isn't available yet? I would just hope that everybody would want to do it. I mean, we're trying to make it really simple. It's ideally, it's going to be first thing in the morning. It's going to be taking place in the classrooms. Uh, Desi and the and DPH all say, and I agree with this, that kids can, kindergarten and higher can test themselves. Um, so the materials will be dropped off to each building and each building is going to have a set day. For instance, I would like the high school to be on Thursdays. I set that up because I feel like that's five days after the weekend. I think it's a great day for the high school to be tested. And I just really feel like if we're going to have positives, they're going to fall somewhere on Thursday or Friday. Um, so each Thursday, first thing in the morning at the high school, all the supplies will ideally be in the classrooms. The kids that are consented will do the testing with the two swabs. Those will then get packed up and sent off um, by carrier to the labs 
And that's what Joe Griffin's going to be doing as the COVID nurse. So each each week he's going to be at different buildings in the mornings to get this all wrapped up and taken care of. Um, as far as incentive, incentive, incentive is freedom. <laughs> so if we can get people to do the testing, especially those that are unvaccinated, um, because it's more important that we're testing them in a sense, I think that we could do really well here in Marblehead Public Schools. We want to be in school every day and we want our kids to be in school every day with us. And so we want football and we want cheerleading and we want, you know, all the extracurricular activities that we want. We want our lives back. So I, I would hope that that's incentive enough. Okay. All right. Thanks, Deanna. Yeah. Emily? Um, so one option might be, whoa. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to send out maybe at the lower level an actual handout to every student um, because that sometimes is easier for parents to actually follow through with because not everyone reads the full email or reads the email. I think actually getting that paper in the homework folder um, might help get more people uh, signed up. And if it's bright yellow, that helps too. <laughs> I certainly do think that we are allowed to do it any way we feel best. So that's definitely something we could talk about with the younger school principals for sure. Um, Sarah, I see your hand up again. I'm just going to ask a quick question if that's okay, or two actually. Dana, how does this, if we have vaccinated students who are close contact, uh, what did they, what's their protocol? Is it the same where they come and test each morning or are they okay to just remain in school without any additional testing? So if you're a vaccinated student, you're gonna fall under the exempt um, examples, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit when I start talking about quarantine and close contact. However, anyone vaccinated or unvaccinated who becomes symptomatic or with similar symptoms will have to be tested. So ideally they will go into a situation if you're talking about a vaccinated person, we still wanna be able to identify people that they were exposed to COVID because I think that knowledge is really important. Um, we would be able to say to them, oh, well, I'm vaccinated, they would say to us, and then we would say to them, okay, well, we really do want you to just monitor for symptoms over the next 14 days. Uh, if they become symptomatic, they should then not come to school, go and get tested. And if they tested negative, we could then shift them into the test and stay at that point because we're still gonna be looking at seven days post exposure. So if they wanted to immediately participate in the test and say, would they be able to do that? I don't see why not. I mean, Desi says no, like they, they say they don't encourage it. Desi even went as far as to encourage that vaccinated people don't be part of the test and stay. However, with what happened in Provincetown, I don't know that that's our best decision. Like that's our best choice. Um, as a town, we can talk to Andrew Petty and the board of health and see what they think. Um, I'm not an alarmist, but I do want to try and do this as well as we did last year. Absolutely. And then will the consent that people did last year, will that carry over into this year or will we have to redo those? It does not. It's all, it's all new consent. All right. Great to know. Uh, Sarah. Question again. Okay. So that, that piece is one of the pieces I was going to ask about. I wanted to make it re really, really clear to parents don't think just because you enrolled in that beacon program from last year that's a carryover it's like a new permission slip for a new field trip for a new year essentially um but one of my questions is so the symptomatic testing makes sense what happens if we have a child come to the office that's symptomatic and they we don't have consent to test them um are we allowed to test symptomatic kids period my guess is no and if they refuse consent, is that an automatic thing they have to go home? And if so, for how long? I'm gonna be able to cover that for you when I get in my quarantine discussion, but you already kind of answered it. If a family does not consent, we cannot test their child. And if they decide not to consent, they will be treated just like last year under the scenarios last year. If you have symptoms, you're gonna to have to go get tested. And if you decide not to get tested, you will be ice, you will be quarantined for 10 days, not able to return to school until the 11th day, unless you have a doctor's note that says you have a different diagnosis other than COVID. All right, I think that's it. You can carry on, Deanna, thank you. Okay. Next slide. So the next thing I was gonna talk about is the COVID symptoms. They're basically the same symptoms as last year, but there's a couple of new nuances. Um, I'm just going to read them through. 
Uh, so symptoms list, fever 100 or greater, chills and shaking, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, new loss of taste or smell, muscle aches and body aches. Those are the bolded symptoms. Those are the top five symptoms that we're really looking for. When we go a little further, there's cough, but not due to any known other cause, like a chronic cough, that won't count as a COVID, a COVID symptom. Sore throat, when in combination with other symptoms, would count. Uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, when it, within combinations of other symptoms and no other diagnosis, like IBS, would count. Headache, when in combination with other symptoms, so it would be headache and fever and sore throat. Fatigue, when in combination with other symptoms, and nasal, nasal congestion or runny nose, not due to other known causes such as allergies when in combination with other symptoms. These have changed because we know more about COVID. Uh, even though there's different variants, we still are looking for these types of symptoms when we're thinking about a student or a staff person coming into the health office with COVID. Um, the daily health attestation has been updated. It has basically the same questions except for updated all of those new symptoms that I just mentioned and how they were written up. And then we have in the past 14 days, my child has not been exposed to anyone with the following, those symptoms again listed. Then in the past 14 days, my child has not been in close contact within six feet indoors of an infected person for at least 15 minutes over a 24 hour period to anyone diagnosed with COVID-19. And then we do still want to have up to four emergency contacts because we will need students to be dismissed should they become positive or symptomatic and, and ill at school. Um, the, this is the daily attestation. We ask that people look at it each morning, kind of look and ask those questions, whether they're staff or their students. They, this does not need to be filled out and taken into the school nurse, but we do have to diligently think about this because like I was saying, we're not a testing site. We do not want sick people coming to school. We want kids to stay home if they're sick and have those families follow up with their primary care should they feel like it's something that needs to be, um, you know, that goes beyond a normal illness for a child. We also, I, I've sent that, the new daily health attestations to Emily Dean because there will be some languages we need those translated into and she's on, on, on doing that now as we speak. Um, are there any questions on that? Because then I'm gonna move on to close contacts and uh, quarantine. Sarah? Um, just because it popped in my head and it will be gone otherwise, can we find a way on the website to have, I've seen other schools have a list of area testing sites with like their web link and even like sometimes their phone number, their hours. I think the easier we make it for people to get tested, the more likely they are to do the right thing and, and to test. Um, so I'm just wondering if we can do a page for that somewhere on on our website. Yes, I wouldn't see why not. It's pretty easy. Uh, there's a link on mass.gov already that does exactly that. You just stick in your zip code and it gives you numerous choices to go get tested. Okay. All right. I, does anybody have any other questions? Okay. I think you can continue on. Okay. So the definition of close contact, this has only changed very little. Close contacts are defined as individuals who have been within six feet of COVID-19 positive individual while indoors. That's a big one, while indoors, for at least 15 minutes during a 24 hour period. Please note at risk exposure time begins 48 hours prior to symptom onset of the positive person or, uh, or time of positive test if asymptomatic and continues until the time that the COVID positive individual is in isolation. Multiple brief or transitory interactions less than one minute throughout the day are unlikely to result in 15 minutes of cumulative contact and do not meet the definition of close contact per CDC definition of close contact. Are there any questions about that? Go ahead. Okay, so close contact exemptions. Certain close contacts are exempt from testing or quarantine response protocols as long as they remain asymptomatic. So everyone in the exemption has to remain completely asymptomatic to still fall under the exemption. The exemptions are as follows. Asymptomatic, fully vaccinated close contacts. 
If you are a fully vaccinated staff person, a fully vaccinated student, and you have been identified as a close contact, if you are fully vaccinated and asymptomatic, you do not need to do test and stay, you do not need to quarantine. You do, however, need to be able to mod, you know, assess your symptoms for 14 days from that last day of exposure. Because if you do become ill, and we know that there are breakthrough cases happening, that's when you need to not come to school, not come to work, go get tested and figure out what's happening with your health. The second exemption, classroom close contacts. Individuals who are exposed to COVID-19 positive individual in the classroom, while both individuals were masked. So long as the individuals were spaced at at least three feet apart, they are exempt and not considered a close contact. That is why I am encouraging that where space allows, we use three feet distancing at Marblehead Public Schools because it will cut down on kids that need to be isolated, kids that need to test and stay, and kids that need to, um, would be exposed. In the younger schools, I know that this is gonna be an issue, but we'll be aware of the building rooms, activities, all of those things will all be traced with who's in what group, who's sitting where, and what's happening at those times so that we will be identifying those kids as close contacts and hopefully they'll consent and we'll get them in test and stay. The third exemption is bus close contacts. Individuals on buses must be masked according to federal requirements. As such, individuals who are masked on buses with the windows open are not, they'll be told that there was a positive on the bus, but they are not identified as close contacts. Again, we're gonna want those people to also modify, mod, um, assess their symptoms for 14 days from last day of exposure. And then close contacts who have had COVID-19 within the past 90 days. If they have been exposed as a close contact, they are exempt. Exposure must occur within 90 days of their symptom onset. Individuals must also be fully recovered and symptom free at this time. Those are the four categories that exempt you from having to do test and stay or be quarantined. We will still notify families because they need to still look for symptoms 14 days past exposure. Any questions on that? Megan? Okay. Plugging in headphones, just a minute. Deanna, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a way to boil this all down so that it's easy for parents to understand. I mean, I know there's a lot of information here, but is there a way to have some type of summary or flow chart or something that's easily understood for parents so they know exactly what they need to do in a given situation? I wrote notes myself today. My notes are only for this, they're, they're only three pages long. I, I, I told um, John that I would be sharing them. I can share them with you. I can share them with him. We can certainly put them up on the nurse's virtual you know, we can share them. This is just, I'm, I'm looking at all this paper and I'm trying to dial it down to like make right. it as simple as possible. Um, so I can certainly do that. And I think I told you at the last reopening meeting, Jesse is supposed to create a flow chart. When they do, I'll take a look at it. If it looks good, we can use it. If not, uh, we can either dummy it down to make it simple. A lot of this, there's too many words in some of these things and it makes it very confusing. So that's why I'm trying to carve it as simple as I can. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I just think, um, you know, my head's spinning trying to, I'm not sure how I'm going to remember it all. So I think if we want everyone to know exactly what to do, we'll just, you know, there's a way. And to that is what we did it. last year. Last year we had five, I created five steps of what to expect. When we would end up having people in these situations, the nurses had all this stuff and we just sent it in the email to the parents. We went over it all with them because I want them to not be lost in the woods. I want them to be able to understand it. The more that we can get everyone to understand, I think the better we're going to do. Right. And I guess I'm just thinking off the top of my head too, but maybe this is something that we can make sure we address in each open house as well. Like really go through this um, again, just so parents hear it again and can ask questions if necessary. Of course. And I, and I think that the nurses are very open to taking phone calls and emails from parents about all of this. Oh yeah. We're absolutely. in the same place and not in the same place all at the same time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions right now. Okay, so this is the protocols. This is, if you think that made you dizzy, this is gonna make you dizzier. Here we go. So testing and quarantine response protocols. Protocol A, pretty simple. Individuals who test positive. 
It's the same as before. They have 10 days of isolation from symptom onset or date of positive test. That's a slam dunk, easy to deal with, done, okay? Moving into protocol B, asymptomatic close contacts. This is the one, protocol B has three different options. B1 is called test and stay. We will allow asymptomatic close contacts to remain in school and participate in sports and extracurricular activities as long as they take a Bionex Now test daily for up to five days. If you wanna participate in weekend school sport activities, you will need to test on those days too. This will not be managed by school because on the weekends, we're not there. So I know just as a mom and as a medical person that people can buy Bionex Now brand um, rapid antigen tests at CVS. I, I'm sorry that it's not gonna be a free thing. This might be something we all need to kind of talk about and figure out. But if you are placed in test and stay, and I don't know, there's a Saturday soccer game and you're in and have been identified as an exposed contact, you cannot go to that soccer game unless we know that on that morning you tested Bionex now and you were negative. That is considered a school activity. But when you are in test and stay at school, we are controlling you in our school environment. When you are on the weekend and you're not having extracurricular activities and you're not having school sports, you are in quarantine. Does that make sense? These are only, you're only exempt for these school qualifying activities, not for the rest of the world. So that's, I think, really important for people to take away here. So you have the rapid Bionex now test daily for up to five days. You wear a mask at school at all times, except when you're eating and drinking. When you take off your mask for eating and drinking, you need to remain three feet from others when you've been identified as a close contact. When seven days from the date of exposure includes weekends or holidays, the individuals should quarantine on those days. And if they remain asymptomatic, may return to school to be tested immediately in the morning, that following Monday or whatever the day is that we then return back to school. You must conduct active monitoring for symptoms through day 14 and self-isolate at home if symptoms develop. That is B1 test and stay protocol. Does anyone have questions on that? Sarah, I saw your hand go up and then Megan. So to, a couple of things. First, I don't think we're carrying along with our slides here. I think we're several slides behind the presentation. No, these aren't slides, Sarah. They okay, I was like B1. I, I can don't send you this if you would like it. I made it in notes today. Okay. Okay. Um, and then as far as the, the weekend extracurriculars go, so if they're buying the test at CVS, like this is totally on our system that they're really buying the test. It's like, we're not seeing results from, you know, the CVS results if they're doing it at CVS. Like if they're doing the over-the-counter one, it's completely the honor system. Well, I don't know. See, this is all, this is the moving parts that we have going on right now because this is all new. So honestly, I haven't sat down and had a discussion with anybody about how we're going to do this on the weekend. Okay. I have to be honest with you. I have no idea. Okay. I just, as terrible as it sounds, I, I don't have a ton of faith in the honor system where this is all concerned. Like my, I don't my, level, my level of faith is I, I have my results and here's the printout from the counter at CVS or from urgent care or from wherever, but I don't, I just don't have the, it the, in the other way. And I think about it also because we're bringing in people from other communities. So say at the, at the, I don't know, the baseball or the basketball game, or whatever it is on Saturday, we could be bringing in a team that has five students that should be on quarantine, but we're on the honor system. Like, and we're bringing well, them into our community. I'm not going to go for the honor system in this situation. Yeah, I, I okay. think we could, you know, I could talk to athletics. We could talk, we could have some conversations in regards to, you know, I can train people. You don't have to be a medical staff person to do Bionex now. We could train those people that are in charge, the coach of the team. I don't, those, these are all things that are moving and we have to figure out. And then they could test those students prior to the activity to make sure that they actually 15 minutes later are negative and continue to stay. But I can't speak for that because I don't have that power, but those are the thoughts in my mind. Okay, that's that's good to know though. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on B1 test and stay? 
Megan, did you have a question? I, did. I, I appreciate that, Deanna, and certainly I'm sure Greg and the coaches, if there's a way to make sure they're adhering to every policy and procedure, we'll do that like we did last year. But I want to say I have great faith in the community from a standpoint of the honor principle. I mean, we're all in this together. People want to be safe. I think the attestation is an honesty principle and we need to make sure that someone doesn't have symptoms at home and come to school. Um, that's gonna happen with the 3000 kids we have in the district every day. We want people to stay home if you're sick. That is going to be an honesty principle. And then certainly if a student exhibits some symptoms in school, we've identified another way to handle that. But I'm, I have uh, a high amount of confidence that everybody in Marblehead is in it to win it and will participate. But if there's a way we can support that, which in these instances, the it's only going to be someone who's been identified as a close contact prior to a sporting event. And I'm hoping that those numbers um, will be very low, given that we are talking about a lot of uh, students that are already vaccinated at a high vaccination rate and we're going to be going back to school with masks so just wanted to make that general comment thanks thank you megan i think you've got a question as well yeah the only thing i wanted to add to it and dean i appreciate that you know the athletics piece probably still has some moving parts to it um but can i just ask john if maybe greg and deanna can come back to us sometime relatively soon on what the plan is for athletics. And if there's something we need to do, for example, if we need to make sure that there are those rapid tests, um, you know, available for coaches and athletes, then then let's look at what it will take for us to, to do that. But if they can come back with a recommendation, that would be great. Thank you. Just really quick, um, someone has their hand up in our public comments. The uh, section was at the beginning, so I apologize. Okay, so moving on then to, to B2 is, is um, so we're still on protocol B, asymptomatic close contacts. Section B2 is traditional asymptomatic close contact. Individuals who have not chosen to participate in test and stay. If you are an individual whose family has decided not to participate in test and stay, you will quarantine for seven days from last exposure. Just like last year, you will not come to school, you will not go to activities, you will quarantine for seven days from last exposure. If you remain asymptomatic, you may test on day five or later and with a negative result may be released from quarantine on day eight. You will also conduct active monitoring for symptoms through day 14 and self-isolate should symptoms develop. That's pretty straightforward, that's the traditional way that people could test out of quarantine early last year as long as they remained asymptomatic. Any questions there? I think you okay. can go ahead. Okay. Uh, also- Excuse me. Excuse me, Sarah. When, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. When are the parents allowed to speak at the end? Do they ask questions during, or is there another day where parents get to speak? So the public comment section was at the beginning of our meeting. We will okay. have another public comment section at the beginning of Thursday's meeting as well. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So again, still protocol B, asymptomatic close contacts. Section B3 is no testing. Alternate protocol for those who choose not to test. Quarantine is at least 10 days from last day of exposure. Same thing as last year. Remain asymptomatic and you may return to school and activities on day 11. You are to conduct active monitoring for your symptoms through day 14 and self-isolate if symptoms develop. That is basically protocol B, which is the asymptomatic close contacts. The third category is symptomatic individuals. They call that protocol C. It only has two sections. C1, return to school post symptoms with a test. The duration is dependent on the symptoms resolution. You may return to school after you have received a negative PCR test or so long as the individual is not a close contact, 
If a medical professional makes an alternative diagnosis for COVID-like symptoms, the individual may use a written medical recommendation in lieu of a PCR test to return to school. They also must have improvement in symptoms before they return to school. They must also have been without a fever for at least 24 hours without using any fever reducing medications to return to school. Note, if the symptomatic individual was a close contact who is not exempt from testing and quarantine response protocols, after symptoms resolve and they receive a negative PCR test, they should be followed in the B1 protocol for test and stay depending on the last day of exposure. So with that being said, if someone within three days has had symptoms, they were a close contact, they went and got a PCR test, it came back negative, we're still in that seven day window of the last time they were identified and exposed to that close contact. We'd like them to slide into the test and stay at least until those days are complete. Does anyone have questions about symptomatic individuals who return to school after their symptoms and after their test? You were completely right. My head is swimming. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm yeah. not. I'm really not an alarmist, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I think if there is a way that we could get this information before Thursday, just because our thinking on these two meetings was that we could digest information and then be able to ask more questions come Thursday. I think that might be helpful. If it, you know, I if it's possible, you know, that... this is what I created today for myself. I'll just send it to you. Great. Sure. John. So in the document that's in the materials folder, there is a link to the DESI guidance document that has these colored boxes that Deanna is reading from. So you can have a chance to go back and see symptomatic, asymptomatic protocol, A, B, and C, B1, B2, B3, because obviously it is very detailed and confusing. And so the public has access to those now and school committee has them in your packet. Thanks. You do, but Sarah, I really cut them. I, I really made them very, I don't mind sharing what I have because it's crazy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if no one has questions on C1, I can just move on to C2. Okay. C2, return to school for individuals who are not close contacts and have chosen not to receive a COVID test. Isolation is at least 10 days from symptom onset. Return to school after 10 days, returning on day 11. This is just like last year. Have improved symptoms and have been without fever for at least 24 hours without the use of redu fever reducing medication. I believe that is all my information for you tonight. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Thank you very much, Deanna. Thank you, Deanna. So we'll go to the next slide. And uh, I listed some department updates. I am not going to have each department or director report out uh, this evening, but there is some good information that I think that you will appreciate having. Um, it didn't make it into a 57 page document this year, uh, but I've asked uh, Richard Kelleher to talk about the federal uh, lunch program that's continuing. I'm going to ask Steve Quietek to talk about some of the technology uh, enhancements that have happened this year. And then if you have other questions for that are departmentally specific, I wanted to allow time for that. So we'll ask Richard to jump in. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, that's my grandson, Finn, in case anybody was wondering. It's not like I'm proud of him or anything. Um, <laughs> this year, the federal government has deemed that they will be paying for all the meals. Um, there's a upside to that and there's a downside. The upside is uh, it may enhance participation. The downside is their reimbursements don't generally cover all of our costs. So we'll have to see how that's going to affect us. Uh, an issue I think that's near and dear to a number of people in Marblehead is that we no longer have any foam products in our possession. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that's been a long road. It's not an inexpensive process, but uh, I think it's worth it. And uh, it supports the community at large. Um, my staff is back for the most part. We do have some shortfalls in terms of bodies, but we'll manage that. And as this whole process unfolds after listening to Deanna and John and everybody else, I'm in very, I've been here 26 years. I've been very impressed with the entire leadership group, um, both community, school committee, and the administrative group in, in the, uh, at Nine Winter Road. It, I'm very proud to be a part of that group. 
Well, that's very kind, Richard. The check is in the mail. Thank um, you, sir. <laughs> Stephen Quietech has a lot to celebrate in terms of advancements in technology. It's it's uh, last year at this time, our woes were in technology. And so I think it's worth celebrating all that he has been able to accomplish. So Stephen. Thanks, Dr. Bucky. Our tech team has been working hard this summer. We've been able to accomplish many upgrades and updates this summer. We've increased our internet bandwidth to a two gigabit uh, fiber internet connection for the district. We've purchased a new firewall, allowing for the increased internet speed to go along with the new fiber internet. We've been adding more Wi-Fi in all of our buildings. We've probably completed the high school to about 95% of what the three to one Wi-Fi plan will be for us going forward. We've had uh, an upgrade for our phone systems. We've upgraded our district office, the village school, the high school. Uh, we're planning to move forward with the vets and the Glover schools next. We are waiting on some additional equipment to be delivered, but some delays have happened and we're expecting all that equipment to arrive over the next few weeks. Our Brown School is gonna be a wonderful new school and it was just connected with the new fiber yesterday and we activated the internet connection to the building today. Uh, besides the needed hardware upgrades we've been working on, we've also deployed a new website and just today started using our new Blackboard notification system. So a lot of good new technology for our district. Thank you, Stephen. I'm sure it's not lost on anyone that the superintendent had technology trouble to start the meeting this evening. So it's nice to be able to pivot back and to celebrate uh, the advances in technology that we've had. Next slide, please. So the, I'll open it up that if individual committee members have um, questions for me or any of the directors, um, uh, Mr. Griffin has joined us. Uh, his technology troubles are over, so we can circle back uh, to hiring of the long-term sub-nurse and COVID coordinator. Wonderful. Uh, Q&A. All right, yeah, I think we'll stick with this and then we'll circle back to the, the nurse piece. Uh, Megan, I see your hand up. You're gonna put headphones on. Um, it's not necessarily a question at this point, but I do just really want to thank Richard specifically for getting all the styrofoam pieces out of the school. You know, this has been a thorn in my side for a long time. Um, so I'm really appreciative for the work that you have done there. And also, um, Stephen, I love the new website. It looks amazing. Um, but that in conjunction with everything else you've been working on, I know you've been working really hard at the Brown School and there's so much great um, availability, I guess is the best word I can think of at the Brown School. I think the students there are going to have some really great experiences. So, um, you know, and all the issues that we talked about with our remote learning and hybrid learning last year, you know, I know you've taken that and really run with it. So just, you know, great work, guys. Thank you so much. I, the summer's been short and we've worked really hard. So we just appreciate it. I mean, not that everyone hasn't worked hard, but those two are the ones who spoke. So thank you. Any other questions? Sarah, I don't have you open my screen, but I'm, I'm gonna guess that you've got a question. <laughs> Always a safe guess. Um, <laughs> so I, um, my question's for Richard. Um, I know that we're participating in the federal program for the lunches. Um, what I'm wondering is, are we even able to, but are we going to also be having those a la carte items that are available? And I ask that because I know that's a big revenue driver. Um, and that might help offset some of the some of the loss of revenue by what the reimbursement rate is. So I was just wondering if we're allowed to do that as part of this, and if so, if we were going to. Um, and then the second to the question to that is, will it still be the program where parents order like a week at a time ahead of time, or no? Can they do choose day to day? Sarah, I can play the role of Richard on one piece of that and that yes, a la carte options uh, will be available uh, for students. And uh, we were talking about the revenue generating piece 
of that as the reimbursement does not cover the cost of the quote unquote free lunch program. And each building principal is sending out, they've been working with Richard and Todd on lunch in general and where lunch will be and spacing and all of that. So I will have him connect with you uh, on the ordering options and how food service will be delivered. That sounds great. And I know at one point Richard had some creative ideas of other ways to kind of make some food offerings um, to offset some of those revenue drivers. Um, so if if we want to explore some of those as well, that might be a good idea. So I'm um, just going to ask a quick, quick question um, to kind of follow up on Sarah's. Um, I think it would be great if we could get the info because that was one of my questions about is it the pre COVID lunch op op offerings or the COVID style that we had last year. Both are great. So just kind of wondering. Um, and then the lunch overages. I think it's great that we're going to look at creative ways and, and old ways that have worked for us and, and be able to utilize those. Is that something that can be covered by ESSER if at the end of the year we, we don't have um, room in any in other lines to cover it? I will get you an answer to that. I don't want to say yes, we can use ESSER funds, but the guidelines for using ESSER have been so liberal, but I wouldn't want to say that, yes, you could use that to make up a uh, deficit in your operating budget. John, I think one of the one of the very few clear pieces of it, if I recall, are you cannot use it to replace lost revenue. I think that that was spelled out really quick, clearly that it can't be to make up a revenue de deficit and where this would be that I think. Um, can I jump in just for a second here? I do have the answer to that question. Um, Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Um, we cannot use it as a revenue offset. However, if we do have a shortfall in um, one of our revolving funds now, we can actually charge the salaries and expenses for that program to the grant. So essentially it is a revenue offset now allowed. Um, that was new as of June. And um, so if we do have a shortfall in any of our revolving programs due to COVID, we can transfer the cost to the grant. So essentially it would cover a shortfall. So yes, we do have that safeguard, but we do not anticipate um, we'll need that. We, we are being very creative. Richard is putting um, vending machines with water bottles, with credit cards that can be accessed after school hours and, and whatnot. So we're, we're trying to be very creative in terms of, of increasing our revenues at this point. And I just went to the first meeting with the uh, town administrator on ARPA funds and the allocation coming to Marblehead and what those uh, might be used for. So um, I will work with him as well to see if, you know, maybe it can't be used to cover this, but another aspect as Michelle said. Great, and then um, I've got a quick question for Stephen. I know the answer to this question, but I just really wanna highlight how much you've done. So the, you mentioned three to one at the high school. Can you explain that and then remind us what it was last year? Um, so pretty much three to one means that in every classroom, if you have one student, that they'd be able to connect three devices at the same time. So uh, if a student has a laptop, a cell phone, a tablet, and by some chance they want to use them all at the same time, that the infrastructure would be able to handle uh, the traffic and the bandwidth for all of those devices. So we're very close. We're not quite there yet. Some of the equipment we're still waiting on, but it is arriving very soon. So uh, we're getting close. That's great. And where were we at last year at this time or when you came on? Probably less than one per student. We were able to use a Smith Corona SL500 typewriter on the system. <laughs> With whiteout. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I think, you know, it, 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 I sat on the high school SAC um, the last two years, I think. And that was one of the things that the students regularly brought up, um, you know, pre-COVID as well. So I think it's just, it's really great that we're addressing those types of things. Um, and it's exciting for the students. I think it'll cause much less frustration on their side. So thank you. Thank you. Any other Sarah, questions? Is, is this a good time to ask? Because I still had notes here with questions from the beginning of the slideshow. Yep, go ahead and go back. Um, so one of the questions, the notes was air purifiers, any teacher who wants one can has access to it. 
if there is a parent that really wants one in their child's class, can they make that request through Todd as well that that specific classroom have one? Yes. Okay. And then um, everything we, we see coming out, it says K through 12 for um, masks. I, I'm assuming that what we'll convert that to is all of our students seeing as we go beyond 12 and we start before K. Um, but I just want to make that clarification. I think the mask mandate is applying to any any student, but early childhood often has separate regulations. So I want to clarify for our youngest learners, but I think students in um, that receive services up to 22 would be included. Okay. Um, if we can hopefully for maybe by Thursday, get some clarification on that pre-K piece. Cause I know um, a, a chunk of that pre-K program does, do, our children that are, you know, have some higher needs medical included. So I think that that is a piece that parents would like it to know if, if those will be required. Um, and then a couple times during the presentations, I heard, you know, Deanna and John, a couple other people talk about reopening. Is reopening still meeting? No, it's the superintendent's advisory and leadership team that is includes uh, new representatives from MEA. Um, it has uh, new uh, directors. Um, so it's an advisory group um, that still meets. And are there school committee members that sit on that? And if yes. so, who are they? Sarah and Megan. I had planned that to put that back onto the first uh, meeting so that we could discuss that because we had kind of punted it as John reorganized this group. Um, so Megan, and I think Megan, you were on the last call. I was on the one before. Um, and so we'll, we'll circle back to that. Anybody else have any questions? Megan, you've got the headphones on. Okay. Um, John, on Sarah's question about the air purifiers, um, do you know around about how many air purifiers, purifiers we have with any kind of ratio to classrooms? Ooh, that's a great question. Todd is on the call. My guess is he could, or Michelle through purchase orders, tell us how many we have ordered across the district and then do that calculus and get you that number for Thursday. But Todd or Michelle, if you know how many we have ordered to date. Uh, to date, we have ordered approximately 350. Okay. Um, so the way we went about it is that uh, if they, the rooms did not have windows, we automatically put air purifiers in them. We also installed uh, registers to circulate the air through the, uh, the HVAC systems. Uh, any rooms that had windows, weather permitting, of course, um, even in the winter though, we did have a lot of windows open, but because that was a recommendation, we're gonna be doing that again. You know, have fresh air is the best thing. So the rooms that have the windows, we open windows, uh, we circulate air, but it, 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 as John said, if anyone asks for one, they get one, you know, no, no questions asked. And we try to keep stock of some, just in case, you know, someone asks for them. And I did have a, I received an email from a teacher earlier in the meeting uh, about a room and I replied and I said, of course, we'll bring one over. So we'll put one over there tomorrow. <laughs> Great, thanks, Todd. Uh, we also have ordered um, for various rooms at the, uh, the new Brown School, just in case people want them. I wanna have them in case they need them. But that is also opening with entirely new system and MERV 13 filters already in place. Thank you, Todd. I knew you'd have the answer. <laughs> so I have a question. As the parent of an incoming freshman, it's freshman orientation tomorrow. Um, as far as I know, um, Commissioner Riley's sort of official mandate is coming at some point tomorrow. How are we handling that? So I went to some tours that they have been doing building tours at the vets for the last month and some people were masked and some people weren't. And so Principal Bauer reached out to me and before today's decision and I said, you know, follow suit. If the mandate goes into effect at noon tomorrow and the orientation is at 1230, 
we will provide masks for people to participate in orientation. Great. Um, I think, you know, I think it's be it bears saying um, sort of with this little bit of a window here as as we approach the school year that there's no intention ever of banning masks or not allowing kids to wear them. So for tomorrow's freshman and orientation, if that mandate doesn't actually come through before noon, then it anybody who wants to can show up and wear a mask. And we always have masks in our buildings um, for any student or, or adult to wear. Um, so, you know, and I think it's, it's one of these moving pieces where, um, you know, hopefully we can get, an, if, if Commissioner Riley's mandate does come through before uh, 12 o'clock, maybe we can get a quick email out. Right. Um, or I don't even know if we could call freshman parents just to sort of give that heads up that that the, that expectation has gone through and we will have to mask kids. I think that that's an important point that we want to normalize mask wearing because we have over 200 students who were fully remote last year who are coming back without a remote option that are concerned about being in public spaces. And so we want those students to feel as comfortable in our schools. And so normalizing mask wearing for those students so that they don't feel that they're standing out. Um, so we're sensitive to that and we're already working with principals and teachers to make sure that we are doing outreach uh, to those students coming back. The one that resonates with me is a student that was a kindergartner in March of 2020 is coming back this fall as a second grader. And that's a huge developmental jump and to be back in a classroom uh, when you were fully remote last year. So that is definitely uh, on the radar for us. And I think speaking of the freshmen, you know, if, if you were a freshman in 2020, you are now a junior and that's a, also a huge developmental gap. Yeah. Um, so there, I think, you know, it's sort of just highlights what a lot of students are, are gonna be experiencing and dealing with. Um, but I also think it bears saying that we have, I've heard it, I think it's a 94% vaccination rate at the high school. Um, so that's, that's amazing. So I think, you know, as we all try to process through all of this information that's coming our way and what's safe and what isn't and, and what, when masks are mandated and when we get to make our choices, you know, that statistic to me is, is comforting and very helpful. Yep. Excuse me, Sarah, again, I'm sorry, this is Lori Whalen, I'm a parent. I just- Sorry, hey, Lori, I, I, I can't allow people to um, just kind of pop in, because um, if I do it for you, I'd have to do it for everybody, um, and then I'd lose control of the meetings. So um, there will be an additional public comment um, at Thursday's meeting. Um, any other questions from the committee? Uh, Sarah, you're muted. Yeah, I had an injury right at the, the point that I had my question, sorry. My injury's running away. Um, and I'm regrouping. Oh, lunch, lunchtime. I think that this is a big question, particularly in the younger grades where we have no one vaccinated. How are we handling lunches? Because that is an unmasked um, time, obviously. I know the tents are coming back. Will we offer outdoor lunches? I know that this is a, a, a question that's kicked, been kicked around the community and we might not have that answer tonight, but I'm just um, putting it out there to say it is, I do think it is a question, particularly in that um, unvaccinated population. Yep, it's a conversation that is happening building by building because each building is unique in how the cafeteria is laid out and how many students they can safely accommodate. And so um, it's one of the FAQ things in the 12 page document that talks about lunch and the steps that we will take to make sure that unmasked students eating uh, are maintaining a certain distance and are safe. But lunch is certainly uh, one of the big questions for many schools. And so having the outdoor spaces as an option uh, is, is good. All right, are there any other questions? 
Okay. Um, I will just kind of, you know, again, reiterate that our thinking with this, with these meetings this week, um, and obviously some of the things have changed since we posted them last week, um, both for Marblehead Public Schools as well as at the state level. But our thinking was that we wanted a chance to be able to have this presentation, be able to, you know, in the public comment at the beginning, hear some of the concerns of the community, hear and ask questions um, from Dr. Bucky and the administration, and then really have time to digest it and come back together on Thursday, be able to again hear from the community as they've had time to digest everything so that we can make any decisions that we need to make and so that everybody feels as good as they can possibly feel moving into the school year. Um, so with that, I think we're finished with the uh, plan and we will circle back to Mr. Joseph Griffin. Um, hello, I'm glad that you were able to join us um, welcome. And um, Dr. Bucky, do you want to introduce him again? And um, then we'll give him a chance to say a couple words. Sure. You were provided his uh, resume, cover letter, um, background and experience. Um, he is certified as a school uh, nurse. He'll be our long-term sub uh, across the district, starting at Eveleth, because that building will be opening until October 13th. We have a nurse at every building. We are not down uh, nurses. And uh, then he will also coordinate the detailed COVID mitigation program uh, that you heard about this evening. So I don't know if Joseph, you want to say hello to the committee uh, and then give them an opportunity to uh, ask you questions. Hi, sorry I'm late. Uh, had some technology problems, so uh, I'm not very good with technology all the time. Uh, I just like to say that I really love the Marblehead community. Um, my son's a senior at Marblehead High School this year, and so I was very impressed with everything that, uh, how everything was handled last year. So I'm very excited to be starting with Marblehead. Welcome, and we very much so understand technology difficulties as we're experiencing some of our own this evening. So uh, we're glad that you were able to iron them out and, and join us. Um, does anybody from the committee have any questions for Mr. Griffin? All right, then I will ask for a motion to approve Mr. Griffin as the um, long-term sub-nurse, sub as well as the COVID coordinator nurse. So moved. Emily moved. Megan, I think if you say it, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Second. All right. <laughs> Megan, second. All right. Roll call vote. Sarah Gold, yes. Sarah Fox. Yes. Emily Barron. Yes. David Harris. Yes. And Megan Taylor. Yes. All right. Thank you. That is voted through five to zero. Mr. Griffin, welcome to the community, the Thank school you. community, since you already live in the larger community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that leads us over to the bus fee update. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to, I believe it's Michelle and Todd again. I will let you, you wrote us a memo, so I'll let you bring us up to speed on that and the public up to speed before we have any questions. Great, thank you. So yes, I put um, a memo before you in terms of, um, I just wanted to bring you up to date on um, transportation in general for this current year, on um, this coming year rather. So we have um, roughly, I wanna say about 250 to 300 eligible kindergarten through sixth grade students that we have to transport if they live two or more miles from school. Um, not all of those students will uh, be taking the bus because currently we have roughly 200 seats on the bus um, with two buses that we will be running. The, um, we currently have an issue with attracting drivers. Since I have been joining Marblehead for the past, um, all, going on two years now, um, we have not been able to attract new bus drivers. So we have a bus driver shortage. This is not necessarily um, Marblehead related. It is not Massachusetts related. It is actually a national bus driver shortage that we are having. Um, so right now we are transporting these um, students that we have to transport. 
we are requiring actually a registration process this year, which is actually new to the district. So we can get a handle on which students will be riding the bus to be able to judge um, how many seats we have available on the bus for other students. So um, we will be opening the registration for any eligible students later this week. And um, we will see how many students we have to um, transport who are interested in riding the bus who live more than two miles away. This uh, transportation is mandated for students in grades kindergarten through sixth grade. Currently, we do not transport any middle school or high school students. Um, that is something we may entertain discussions of or um, possibilities in the future. But right now, with a bus driver shortage, we can't even entertain um, thinking of implementing such a program because we're not mandated by um, Mass General Law. So in addition to what we are going to be offering in our new registration process, we are going to um, start with this pilot program that has been long discussed since I actually joined Marblehead a while back. And um, it's kind of a gamble in terms of how many seats we can throw out there initially and offer it to our students. So we would like to offer this pilot program. This will be offered to, again, kindergarten through sixth grade students as our buses do not go to the middle school, high school. And we're gonna open it initially to eight students, which is equivalent to four bus seats um, on a bus. We actually believe that most of these seats are going to be desired on the bus route three. Um, I'm not sure if the bus routes are posted yet to the website, but we will be getting those up any day now if we haven't done that already. Um, I do want to mention, even though um, we have added a number of bus stops, um, which will be available to either students who live the two or more miles away or to these brand new um, pilot program paying bus students, these eight, eight student seats that we're adding to the bus right now will be a paid option. They will be at the cost of $250 per student. Um, I did not yet set a family cap on that, but I was actually going hoping to get some school committee feedback and see if we, we want to put a cap on that as well. We will not be offering any reduced or um, fee waivers due to this because it's actually an optional program. Um, but we do want to pilot it and see if we are able to fill those eight seats, which I am sure we will be able to. And then honestly, if the registration does not go as high as we anticipate, then we will open additional students to those paying families. Um, so I have proposed that we open, open this registration, this optional pilot program registration on Friday. Um, I think by the end of the day, Friday, if we were op to open it at 9 a.m., which is what we were thinking, we'll be able to reach back out to the families by the end of the day and let them know um, if they're able to secure a seat. And it will be on a first come first serve basis. Um, it will be through email, so we're able to track very adequately who was the first to respond. We have a general email set up. It's called transportation at marbleheadschools.org. And we can certainly do it that way. Um, we are going to be, as Dr. Bucky mentioned earlier, operating under COVID protocols, which means that all students on a bus must be masked at all times. The windows must be opened and we will also have assigned seats and that will actually be determined by the drivers and it will be basically who's first on the bus they will seat towards the back of the bus so that students don't have to walk around other students um, to try to minimize any exposure so we would like to offer this pilot program um, because it is actually a fee school committee will need to vote the actual fee um, i know we have talked about this pilot program at length and um, I believe at the Thursday night meeting, school committee will actually take the vote to um, approve this fee. But uh, we would like basically, you know, to see if the school committee is on board to um, offer this program and to see if there are any questions in terms of it. I do want to mention that um, of the stops we have added, um, we did have to run those by the police department. We always have to get police department approval of any new stop. So we worked with our um, one of our drivers who was the most knowledgeable of all the Marblehead streets. And um, we got input from the bus, the um, police department, got approval of these new stops. 
And some of the stops that we were entertaining were not able to be made because of it's not possible to fit a large bus down certain streets in Marblehead. Um, the unique situation here. But um, so we have outlined them and they are on, it's all in um, run three in our bus list. So uh, turn it over for any questions the committee may have. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I saw Sarah's hand first and I saw Megan, then Emily. Um, thank you, Michelle. So I know that this kind of all got launched when um, Dr. Jessica Benedetto approached the school committee about safety concerns about her children and getting to school and things like that. So I know that, you know, we need to be fair and do this lottery, but I'm wondering if we can somehow prioritize people that make a case that their child does not have a safe route, walking route because of, you know, the sidewalk or lack thereof situation in Marblehead, um, that we can kind of prioritize those safety pieces first prior to just whoever gets the email in. It, um, so I'm, I'm wondering about that. And as far as like the family cap goes, obviously I'm always a supporter of a family cap. So um, I would support that as well. Yeah, I was just, I was trying to, Todd and I have tossed this about um, at length about trying to determine which are unsafe situations, which are not, unless we get feedback from the police department, or um, some other input, it's really tough for us in the administrative office to determine what is, un what is unsafe and what is. So that's why we had figured, you know, first come, first serve, we will give advance notice. I mean, I know with Gmail, you can actually schedule your emails to be sent. I don't, not, not that everyone uses Gmail, um, but if we, we set a certain time and give enough notice, we were actually thinking of sending an email out tomorrow to see if we wanna do this registration on Friday. But if school committee feels strongly, you can certainly put it off till next week. But we are looking at the opening of school in just, um, you know, two weeks away. So we certainly want to give families enough time to plan accordingly. Well, I know, like, um, in some situations, for instance, this one, they actually went as far as getting a smart routes audit who documented it being an unsafe route. So I, I think if a family has gone as far as in safe routes, you know, an organization and, and a program that we, we partake in, has deemed it to be unsafe I still I still want to prioritize child safety ahead if we can find a way I understand it puts you and Todd in a difficult position but where Safe Roots is willing to do those audits I would think if someone presents one of those we should kind of try to prioritize that yeah Megan go ahead no go ahead I'll, I'll, I'll go at the end Michelle, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so, Michelle, it, you know, if there's more seats that open up because, you know, the, those people who are more than two miles don't um, come in at the anticipated rate, how do we alert parents who might want to be part of this club? Does it just you sign up now when it's come from serve on the wait list as well? Like, how long? I'm sorry, I can't hear Megan's question. She's so, wanting to know if additional seats open up and there are more opportunities for paying riders, how will families be made aware of that? Or will it be from this initial launch that the wait list will be created from there and the first come first serve, or if there'll be a second launch saying we have an additional five seats available? Thank you. Um, I anticipate we will initially probably have a wait list, um, but I do expect in a pretty short turnaround within the first couple of weeks of school, we will have an indication of how many riders we have. So I think as we work through a wait list, and we can certainly include that in our email that's going out to all families, um, we would, if we have an opportunity, we will certainly um, you know, welcome a second wave of registration and let families know that there are additional seats. Um, I think this can be a very, very lucrative program for us as well as the families who are interested in busing. And, you know, this, this could be limitless in some point. I mean, a lot of school districts do have optional busing, but right now with the driver shortage, it really, really ties our hands in terms of how, how large we can 
offer this program. Yeah, if I can jump in real quick, if we if we actually could get more drivers and we are working on it almost every day, we have four large school buses, um, but we just don't have the people to put behind the wheel on them. So if, if we did have them, obviously we could open up many, many more seats. Yes, thank you, Todd, for adding that. And I mean, we currently are looking to hire part-time bus drivers, full-time bus drivers. If they want full-time with benefits, we will use them for custodial or maintenance in the off, off hours when they're not driving. Um, we will hire bus drivers who literally just want to drive a morning and afternoon route or a morning or an afternoon route. We are open to making it work any way possible. And as Todd mentioned, we do have four big buses, um, so we can actually accommodate a lot of students. It's the lack of drivers, which are funded in the budget. So it's not a funding issue necessarily. It's just, it's, it's a body issue at this point. Michelle, can you hear me now? No, Barely. I think we need new microphones. Can you hear me now? I can't hear her. Yes. I can't hear her. Oh, I, okay. I can hear you, Megan. All right, thanks, Todd. Yep. And then the, you mentioned you've got yeah, routes identified. identified. You're going to post those before, before. sign up? Yes, we'll either send them out with sign up or post that or and or post them. We'll have them posted to the brand new website. And they'll have the times associated with each pickup, right? Yes, we just need to confirm the school start times to make sure that they are what they truly will be next okay. week. Are All we right. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Todd. You're welcome. You're welcome. Emily. Um, I just have a few questions. How many students historically who are two miles away take the bus. Do we know? In K through six? That Normally. is a really difficult question. And Todd may have the answer to that, but typically we have not restricted it in previous right. years due to COVID and um, oh, the school. fact that we only have drivers to run two large buses at this time, we've had to restrict it. Okay, um, so. We, we ran approximately, probably 120 students daily on, on average prior to COVID. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah. It, but that was with year, restrictions? Uh, that was prior to restrictions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when the email goes out to people who are required, or not required, yeah, required to get it, um, is that a separate email than everybody else? And has that gone out yet? No, we were actually working on it today. It will most likely go out tomorrow. Okay. So just since there's 250 people who are eligible, what if they all want to do it? Or is that like unprecedented? Well, if, if uh, I'll, I'll jump in here, if that happens, then we would lose our uh, head custodian at the new Brown school. And I would have to be, I would force be forced to put them on a bus um, in the morning or in the afternoon too. Okay. It, here's, here's the biggest thing. If we had to do that and we had three buses running, uh, imagine what would happen if one were sick okay. and they also, they're entitled to their vacation times. And so that he is our uh, emergency bus driver. Say someone is sick. They couldn't make it in that day. He does jump on the bus and he'll run it in the morning. He'll run back to the school. He, he also runs back in the afternoon, jumps back on the bus. So um, he multitasks very well. Uh, but where the new school is opening, that's going to be very tough uh, to do. And it would really put us in a bad spot if someone else were to be sick. Okay. So that's why we're hoping only 200. That's what we're hoping well, for, yes. Okay. I'd okay. love to transport them all if, if we right. had, you know. Um, okay, so I just want to make sure that it all with the emails and people receiving the emails with the time. Do you have to respond if you get priority to the bus by 9 a.m. on Friday? Is that for everybody? 
No, we're going to keep it open um, until sometime late next week. For oh, okay, the, so there's time. For the regular bus. So that's why we're only reserving the eight seats right oh, now. Oh, got it. So it's just the eight people have to send the email at nine. Yes. Okay, all right. Thank you. But, but I do anticipate we will have plenty of additional seats. I just can't okay. guarantee them at this point. Right. Okay. Thank you. So Sarah, before you say uh, your next question, I just want to say that I think one of the big reasons that we put this on tonight and then aren't voting it till t on Thursday is to give time to kind of smooth out any of the questions or concerns that might come up. So I think, Sarah, your concern um, with the areas that maybe aren't as safe as some of the other areas, um, maybe, you know, you could circle with Michelle after, you know, tomorrow um, and, and and try to get that smoothed out um, and, and work with Michelle to see if there isn't a better way to, to make that work. So I will turn it over to you. Um, so I, I think it goes, well, first of all, I, I just want to make it sure everyone understands that, you know, if come September 30th, one of these families that's more than two miles away who said no, all of a sudden says, I'm done driving my children. I want on the bus, we are legally required to put a, find, a, find a bus, whether we have to outsource and pay private to Healy, no matter what we have to do, we have a legal requirement to meet this. Um, I'm, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm like a little bit in a full blown twitch about this idea that we're about to open this amazing school. And one of our only options is to pull our head custodian. Um, I understand we're in, we're in this conundrum because there's a sh national shortage of bus drivers. Um, but I mean, can we look at incentivizing? Like, I mean, there are bus drivers, they're just not enough for everybody. So maybe we need to be the employer of choice, um, which usually comes down to money as everything does. Um, so I, I don't know, but the idea that, you know, we're, we're in, what I would call a precarious situation where we have barely what we might need. And if someone's sick or if we go, you know, if everyone who's legally entitled to this program chooses to take it, we don't have a custodian. Now this pretty much answers my next question, which was going to be during the transition plan of, of opening the Brown school, which we are still in until October 13th, we had made a promise to the community to provide courtesy buses. Um, I don't see any way possible to, to even remotely do that with what we have for staffing right now. But my question was gonna be, are we offering the courtesy bus still? Um, and if so, how are we managing it and how are we communicating that to those families? Is that the bus from Coffin to Eveleth you're talking about? The there was one from Coffin to Eveleth, and then there was one at one point that we ran from the site at Brown um, for like families that would have been going to the what was the old Bell School and lived in the neighborhood that they could actually get picked up. I think it was actually the same bus. It just made two stops at the site of Brown and, and brought to their respective schools. Um, so are we doing that? If not, we, we need to clearly communicate one way or another. We are suspending this, this courtesy bus program or we're continuing it. And this is how you follow the information one way or another. So last year we did not run the bus from the Brown Bell location. Um, we only did that the year before, um, but we did run the route from Coffin to Eveleth and we will be running that for the first six weeks um, of the school year this year. And I'll make sure that that's included in the email as well. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, again, any other questions that come up um, before Thursday, just reach out to John um, and he can find those answers for us. I just want to say I appreciate Sarah Fox's comments because the Pittsburgh Public Schools delayed the opening of schools for two weeks because they couldn't transport the students they were legally obligated to transport. And so we are in a very precarious position. And if we open um, pay to ride and we increase, we pull that Brown custodian and then somebody calls out sick, 
we don't want families saying we paid for a bus route and now we have to figure out transportation in the morning. And we have been incentivizing, trying to attract drivers. We've offered to pay for their CDL training and a licensure, which is not an inexpensive uh, undertaking. We've advertised high and wide, but let me make this the community appeal. If you know somebody uh, that might be interested, the district would pay for your training. You're laughing, Megan. You could be a bus driver. <laughs> so Megan's going to go to CDL training. <laughs> well, she also has to get air brakes and bu and school bus cert yeah. certification she's, as well. She's game. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I um, actually, Michelle, follow up with me tomorrow because I actually have a few ideas. I know with the, you know, my, with the sightseeing companies, their high times are very opposite the high times of the schools. And many of those bus drivers ha are, 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 well, they're all CDLs. And I may be able to connect you with someone that may be able to great. do work that link out. Okay, great. I will be in the office all day tomorrow. <laughs> all right. Okay, so that leads us to closing business. Um, any new business? All right, we did not have any correspondence to submit tonight. Um, so I will officially adjourn us at 8.51 p.m. And again, we really are hoping that people are going to digest all of the information that came out tonight and rejoin us on Thursday for the continuation of this conversation as well as the K-3 to schedules. Thank you, everyone.